Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Joe Farullo, the publisher and CEO of the National Catholic Reporter. Thank you. Oh, stop. Oh, stop. Um, I know it's a group of Catholics because we're sitting like mass. We're all spread out. Michael McDodd's up there. He wants to leave right after communion, doesn't want to get embarrassed. It's like, okay. All right, you guys. Um, thank you. Very, thank you very much to uh, Carol Costello for helping to arrange this and with uh, Ava on the staff and everyone else up there. Uh, Thank you uh, as well, mostly to uh, President Tim Snyder, who uh, I met just recently, uh, just a few minutes ago, and seems like a nice guy, but probably really isn't because he's a university <laughs> president. But, uh, but thank you all. I really appreciate it. Uh, so as you know, tonight marks 10 years since Francis first became Pope. And 10 years and a couple of weeks before that, as the conclave was about to begin, a guy named Paul Bauman wrote in Commonweal Magazine that he hoped that the Cardinals would choose as the next Pope someone who was a little bit Californian. And I think what he meant by that was someone who's a little more open, a little more welcoming, uh, and a little less rigid. And I think he got his wish. But as the LA Times wrote yesterday, calling anything Californian these days is the opening argument to a real fight. And I think that's true as well, which is what we are here to talk about now. For decades, some of you may remember, there was such a thing as the, Calif as the I'm sorry, the, the Catholic vote. Right? It's mostly democratic, mostly blue collar, very dependable, not anymore. Recent surveys, especially from Pew, show that the Catholic vote is straight down the middle, left and right, and tracks very much the culture war politics of our general politics in this country. So the next two years, I think in the life of the church, as is reflected in the politics of this country will be pivotal. As a lot of you know, Francis started this synodality process where he's asked pastors and bishops, priests to listen to the people in the pews and bring back what they're hearing. This October, we'll have a synod in Rome and then another one in October of 24, Together, as one theologian said, they make up a Vatican III. What happens in that process and how it deals with a lot of the hot budget issues in this country, I think will tell us a lot about what happens to the divisions of the church and how the church continues to influence US politics for better or worse. And that's a lot of what our panel will address tonight. Uh, let me introduce them really quickly, if I may going, I'm left-handed, right to left? Thank you, okay. Uh, Chris White is NCR's Vatican correspondent. He's written for the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal, among other publications, uh, most importantly, NCR. Uh, Chris is also the chief Vatican analyst for NBC News and for MSNBC. Next to him, Nancy Pineda Madrid, She's the T. Marie Chilton Chair of Catholic Theology here at LMU and Vice President of the Catholic Theological Society of America. She holds a PhD from the Graduate Theological Union and is author of several books, including Theologi Theologizing, Theology. thank you, in an urgent key, Violence, Women, and Salvation. Carol Costello, our moderator, is an award-winning journalist and former anchor at CNN. And let me just note that since she's left, the ratings there are in free fall. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Just, you can look it up. I'm not, this is not a commentary. I'm not saying there's a cause and effect, but we have the research to back it up. Uh, she now serves as LMU's special advisor and lectures in journalism. She also hosts the true crime podcast, Blind Rage. Speaking of Blind Rage, Michael Sean Winters. <laughs> is a columnist for NCR. He focuses on the intersection of politics and religion, appropriately enough. He's written as well for the Washington Post and the New York Times, among others, and is author of the book Left at the Altar, How Democrats Lost the Catholics and How the Catholics Can Save the Democrats. And finally, but not least, Gabrielle Poma is an LMU master's student in theology. 
she's earned a bachelor's here at LMU as well in music, especially vocal performance, something that she hopes to combine with her theology and pastoral studies. She was also heavily involved in LMU's well-known and well-regarded De Colores Mission Program in Tijuana. So thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you very much. Carol? Thank you so much, Joe, and thank you for making this possible. I'm so excited to have this conversation because I think it's of the utmost importance. Um, before we dive in, I'd like to thank John Sebastian, our VP for Mission and Ministry, and Robin Crabtree, my dean, the dean of the Bellarmine, uh, there you are, <laughs> Bellarmine School of the Liberal Arts. Um, thank you both because without your support, this wouldn't be possible. So thanks. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'd like to welcome all the people joining us virtually too. I wish we could see you, um, but you can see us. So welcome. Um, and we hope to have a very deep, thoughtful discussion about issues that are very painful to many Catholics of all stripes. Um, so before we get into the crux of the conversation, I just wanna say that we're gonna broach some really difficult topics and some of it's gonna be painful, but I think it's necessary to talk about these things. So let's just dive right in, shall we? Um, I'll start with a difficult, complicated question. Just your thing, Michael, right? Yeah. Catholics have always been divided on issues. I mean, that's nothing new, right? But today it feels different somehow. So I'll pose that question to you, Michael. Why is it different today? So it's thank you to LMU for having us and and uh, Joe for welcoming us and Carol for hosting. Um, the, you know, the polarization of the society is affecting the church in the United States in a way that is not helping happening in the rest of the world. And I think that's really important for us to remember how much of an outlier the United States church is. It's not that there there is some opposition to the Pope in France, some in Germany, some you know, but nothing like the organized, well-funded opposition to Pope Francis that we have in this country. And you combine that with, with the fact that Americans, for a variety of complicated reasons, uh, their, their identity, their sense of what they're going to believe about a particular set of issues is no longer dictated primarily by their, their religion as it is by their politics. The, the first lens that they use is a political lens. And then they go shopping in their religious beliefs for, for arguments that will justify a decision that they've made for other reasons. And I think the problem we have, and it's starting in Latin America, but I think it's a different animal in Latin America, is the faith used to be carried in the culture, right? You, you, you would grow up in a neighborhood and you would say, oh, where are you from? And you say, oh, I, I live in St. Bernadette's. Your, your neighborhood was identified by the parish church. You, we have conversations now, you're the vice president of Catholic mission about mission of, of, of parochial schools, not just universities. You didn't have those conversations 60 years ago. The sisters brought the mission in with them. It was in the air. When you, when you lose that culture, when the culture is no longer carrying the faith, two things happen. One is uniquely American, again, and I think that's our Calvinism of our roots, is the religion will get reduced to ethics, and we have always argued about ethics and continue to. The second thing that happens is this, the, is this polarization. And we've not figured out how to learn the wisdom that Jacques Maritain spoke about when he said, you're born into the world with a liberal heart or a conservative heart. In, in any way, it's not something, it, you can't do anything about that. It's the kind of heart you have in life. And one of the challenges and, and to, to become wise is to learn about the wisdom that's given to the kind of heart you were not born with. You know, it, the internet has algorithms that reward anger and radicalism and, and vitriol and loudness, not wisdom. And so I think we've got to recapture and figure out at a time when, again, if the, if the culture is not carrying the faith, it's going to become more abstract, more notional, more given to, um, to, to divisiveness. You combine that with other forces in our culture, and I think you get, wow, what we have now. So, so Nancy, as a theologian, how do you tackle that? 
Well, that's a great question. <laughs> yes. And I, I think Pope Francis offers us um, all kinds of wisdom and ideas about that with his focus and dialogue and especially on listening and trying to create a big tent Catholicism. And when I think about what he has done, like, for example, when he went to visit in Mexico and then traveled north to the border and he um, in Ciudad Juarez, and he celebrated a mass there, and he's looking across the border into the United States, but he's in Mexico celebrating this mass. And you have all kinds of people in the U.S. who are not able to attend this mass in person. Um, and, and, and it was very interesting because he, he was modeling in some ways a reversal of what we often think about in terms of folks from the South looking longingly at the North. And he's modeling, well, no, wait a second. It's folks in the United States who are looking South because they wish he would come into El Paso to celebrate that mass and he did not. And so I think he uses symbols to try himself as a symbol in particular to try to um, create connections in new and creative ways. And I, and I think that's something that we uh, could learn from. How, what are the symbols that can help us uh, enter into a big tent kind of a Catholicism and understand ourselves as interconnected? So, so Christopher, when the Pope looks at America, and our partisanship. Does he think Americans are just kind of crazy? <laughs> uh, well, it's quite interesting. When Pope Francis visited the United States in 2015, it was the first time he visited the United States, you know, and he did so as Pope. Uh, and, you know, I, I think he thinks, you know, about that trip quite fondly, you know, when uh, he has these famous press conferences on the flight back to Rome. And when he was describing his time in New York, he, he invented a new Italian verb to describe sort of the energy and the chaos there. Uh, so I, I think there's a lot of, you know, appreciation for the United States. Uh, at the same time, I, th I think this Pope is, is someone who is very much aware that for, for a long time, uh, I think the U.S. church uh, was used to, in a sense, using its its money and its influence to get what it wants in Rome. Uh, and he brought a new perspective uh, to that. Uh, and I think that's why the American church has been pretty, you know, in, in some quarters hostile to this pope's agenda. Uh, I do not think this pope uh, hates the American church. I think he loves the American church. Uh, I think this Pope uh, understands the American church, but he is happy to challenge it. Uh, and he's not going to be, you know, afraid to do that. Uh, I think back on an encounter, uh, I want to say it was in 2018. Uh, and it was, there, there was a big conference at the Vatican on, on human trafficking. Uh, and Bishop Mark Seitz, who's the bishop uh, at in, uh, El Paso, Texas, uh, gave the Pope, you know, uh, these two prayer cards. Uh, and they were of children that had been separated from their parents at, at the border. Uh, and, you know, the Pope has repeatedly, when he talked about the US, U.S. church, talked about Bishop Seitz. And what was very interesting in an interview that he gave in November, he says, I don't know a lot about this bishop. I don't know if he's conservative or liberal, but he's the type of leader I want. Uh, and I think that's where he sees America at its best. And that's sort of what he's calling America, the American church, too. So I thought it was important to have Gabrielle on the panel. And I know you don't represent all young Catholics, <laughs> but but I do want to pick your brains about um, young people in the church. So when, as we sit up here and we talk about the divisions in our church and that they're like, you know, split among political lines, what do young Catholics think about that? So jumping off of Carol's point, I'm going to offer the broad disclaimer. We talk a lot about social position in a liberal arts university and we all have one. So I'm a young woman of color. I was born and raised in California. So by nature, my faith, and I'm also Filipino, by nature, my faith is my culture and vice versa. And my faith is oftentimes progressive. So let's just offer it. Let me just put that out there before I answer. I think when we have discourse about young people, we tend to do it almost in a vacuum almost statically. And I think sometimes we lose track of the fact that 
young people inherit what their parents gave them. We lose track of the fact that my generation has inherited the divisions that all my fellow panelists just talked about. Um, repeat the question one more time. Let me make sure that I'm on the I, right I track. Just, I just wonder if, you know, we often hear about how young people are fleeing the church. And we all wonder, well, why is that? Mm -hmm. What are we not giving them? And as part of the reason they're fleeing the church, these divisions, especially these types of divisions that we're saying out loud right now. Yeah. I spy a faculty member in the audience, Brett Hoover, who would tell you that this is the develop, this is the result of long sociological processes, and that it's not one generation's worth of fleeing. It is the result of two, three generations worth of slowly moving away from the church. Um, and we've seen that since the development of the religious right. And it's not just a Catholic um, phenomenon. So young people didn't wake up one day and decide at the age of 12, 13 that they were going to stop going to church. Their parents stopped going to church. Their parents' parents stopped going to church. And we need to remember that. Um, and I think that's what's lacking in a lot of mainstream discourse, that mentors, parents, loved ones, peers, those are all the things that are shaping young people's spiritual decisions. And it's not happening in a vacuum, and it's not happening overnight. Michael, I, I see you're itching to say something. Does that... No, I think I, th I think it's it's largely right that th this has been going on for a long time. I, I, I think... Uh, we have to be careful in saying like, like the religious right manifestation is, is not what caused the departure of people from the church, right? I mean, first of all, there are there are lots of young people who are very conservative who are going to schools other than LMU and 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 are happy with a certain iteration of Catholicism. I think what's what what's important to remember though is, is the the number one dynamic I fear because I don't have any solution for this for the US church is, is more foundational than ideological, which is Luke four says, Jesus announces his ministry that he's come to preach good news for the poor. And what has happened in the post-World War II era is we became affluent. And I think we don't even have the power to hear the words anymore. And to get to what Chris and Nancy were talking about this Pope and his ability to model things is this real sense that if you want to hear what the Holy Spirit is calling us to, you go to the poor. And American Catholics aren't poor anymore. And I think when you're affluent and we learn how to rely on ourselves and we go into a store and we can buy whatever we want and we think with a consumerist mentality. So we think about the church. What isn't the church giving me? And my grandmother never asked that question. That was not a question. A certain generation of Irish Catholic, admittedly largely Jansenistic, <laughs> you know, Catholic asked. And, and so I do think we have to, before the ideology, I think we have to face up to the fact that with affluence comes a kind of secularization and a loss of faith. Not a loss of religious identity. The identity can last long after the faith is gone. And we've not figured out how to pass on the faith to the next generation adequately. And, and it may be something, there's nothing we can do. Oh, don't say that. No, <laughs> no. I, no, go ahead. No, well, I, I mean, I think about myself and my own trajectory. And I know um, when I was an undergraduate student here, uh, within the first 10 years after that, the bishops in this country issued pastoral letters on, on the economy and on one on uh, war and peace and a critique of nuclear armaments. And I remember as a young person thinking, oh my God, the church really does matter in the world. And, and I felt like I can get behind this and I wanna be part of it because it makes a difference. And I, and I think that 
that's at least where, what I hear in my classrooms, students longing for and searching for today, wanting to know where that is happening now. And, um, and not all of those uh, letters were successful. The bishops attempted at that time to write a letter about women. And there were all kinds of debates back and forth that ended up not being successful. And no letter was ever, uh, was ever finally promulgated on, on women. But the US bishops have a history in this country of attempting to, um, to, well, to, to capture our imagination in, in really rich ways. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that we will come back into that again. Well, okay, I wanna go back to, um, you know, Joe mentioned that Pope Francis launched this global discussion in 2021, where religious organizations were required to talk with the congregants about the issues facing the church. And the bishops did release a report, right? Um, and in a section entitled Enduring Wounds, the bishops wrote that Catholics have brought divisions born in the political arena into the pews. Christopher, can you tell us more of what that document said? Sure, and I will do so by going back a, a bit further to try to make a point that I think ties into what uh, my fellow panelists have said. And I think the key to understanding so much of this papacy is to go back to 2007 uh, and to a parasita of Brazil, where Pope Francis, uh, you know, then Cardinal Bergoglio, uh, was the lead drafter of the, the document of this two-week meeting of bishops from, from Latin America. And that document was drafted and the meeting took place after a two-year listening process of Catholics around the world. Uh, and I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that the Latin American church was trying to take stock of what had happened, you know, the, the numbers of Catholics were hemorrhaging to, to, you know, Protestants, particularly Pentecostals, you know, they were trying to make sense of, of sort of the, you know, the unshackled free market economy and the havoc it was wreaking on its people. And the general conclusion was not just that people were leaving the church, but that the church had left the people. And, you know, this whole process was an attempt to for the church to regain this closeness, closeness and connection with the people, particularly those who are poor and on the margins. Uh, and so I think Pope Francis was profoundly affected by this experience as Cardinal Bergoglio and has brought this process to, to Rome and shared it with the global church. Uh, and so now we do have this ongoing consultation process known as this, this Synod on Synodality, which was originally a two-year process, now a three-year process. Uh, where Catholics are free to participate, to share their opinions on very neuralgic hot button issues, many for the first time in their lives being invited to speak up. Uh, and so what do we have in the, this document that you referenced? Well, a lot of opinions that really, you know, have never been aired so publicly at such a high level in the Catholic Church before. Uh, it's invited a lot of open conversation. And, and I think Pope Francis is very comfortable not knowing how it's all going to conclude. I think, you know, it's fair to say that with John Paul II and Benedict, they, they weren't comfortable with starting conversations that they couldn't control. Pope Francis really thinks something healthy can emerge out of this. And so we have this period uh, of, of listening and consultation where issues such as the role of women, the role of divorced and remarried Catholics, LGBTQ Catholics, but not just, you know, the, the sexual, you know, pelvic issues, you know, my, migrants, poverty, the environment, all of this is being sort of put center stage in a very new and real way. And it's not just the vertical relationship, it's much more horizontal. Are they having a civil conversation? Because from the outside, it doesn't seem that way. It seems that there are a certain number of more conservative bishops who are against the Pope, are afraid that the Pope is changing the church too quickly and 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 not for the greater good. Yeah, I, I think one of the observations that was made by one of the participants at one of the Vatican press conferences on the Synod was that uh, we had a lot of disagreement, but no one that took part in it regretted their participation. Now, I haven't been in these rooms, so I can't say that this is true, but I, I'm just speaking uh, to one person's experience. Uh, I think Pope Francis is very aware of the tensions that have emerged over the last few years through the synod process. Uh, 
but you know, the Pope who loves to quote literature often uh, uses this phrase uh, from Don Quixote that when the dogs are barking, it's a sign that we're moving ahead. And I think this is something that, you know, he's certainly unafraid, you know, he wants civility, yes, but when he was asked about uh, the criticisms from Cardinal George Pell, the late Australian Cardinal who died in January, the Pope said, look, you know, I prefer that they do it, you know, to my face, but criticism is a human right. So I don't think he's very phased by the fact that people are criticizing the process. But, but Michael, isn't this, you could argue, this new openness only dividing us further? I, I think there's a case to be made that that the Pope and the bishops need to manage the expectations a little bit better. What I don't undervalue is to see, and I think sometimes it's coarse, when, when a bishop calls a cardinal a heretic, you've gone too far. I mean, just, you know, uh, this, this is not, this is not, uh, uh, this is bruta figura, as the Italians say, you know. Um, I, but I, I think what I hope we'll take away would, is, is that we can disagree about the moral decisions of the church. One of the undervalued qualities of this pope is I think he expects us to be adults. So when he says the church should inform your conscience, not replace it, this is a really important saying. It was implicit when he said, who am I to judge? That person has a conscience and, and can make decisions for their own life. We live in an age, my friend Kathy Caveney, who teaches at Boston College, likes to say, you know, anybody with a, a, a copy of the catechism, an attitude, and an internet connection thinks they're a theologian. And this is not true. Like theology is a is a discipline. You have to know the, the tradition. And 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 if you don't know the tradition, then, then you're doing something other than theology, right? Like we're called not just to be in communion with one another, but we are called to be in communion with the church of the first century and the fourth century and the 12th century and the 16th century. And so there's, there is this need, I think, to get back to, well, what do we still believe? What, do, what does unite us as Catholics? And every Sunday in the most conservative parish here in Los Angeles and in the most liberal parish, we get up and we recite the creed. What's not in the creed? There's not a single ethical statement. There are ethics that we draw from that. When we, if we believe that we are created in the image of this God who we describe in the creed, that, that puts some responsibilities on us. But I think we, as Catholics, we miss that step, or at least my generation missed that step. And, and I think we still, on something like Catholic social teaching, we still treat it like it dropped out of the sky in 1891, rather than saying, no, 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 this is rooted in our scriptures. This is rooted in our doctrines. But, but how, you know, where's the Christian anthropology that, that connects that? And right. Well, I, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. I think, though, um, I think we're also united by symbols. Like, I think Catholics, whether they're on the right or the left or down the middle, we're all going to affirm that the Eucharist matters. It's important. And we may understand it very differently, but it matters and it matters to all of us. And I think part of the, the genius of what Francis is doing, even by allowing us to air our differences, is the fact that if we can learn to listen to one another in the midst of us, in the midst of our airing our differences, then perhaps we can appreciate that we all love this church, even though we see it rather differently from one another. So how do you grow a big tent Catholicism? And I think that's driving him and that's why he can trust the process. But I, I, I concur the uh, affirmation of our, uh, who we are as human beings created in the image and likeness of God is what is constantly uh, a challenge, especially for, for what you were saying, Michael, earlier about uh, folks in this country who are maybe more middle class and the attention on the poor constantly that this Pope is placing and on the vulnerable. We're not very comfortable with that or trying to figure out how do we have an encounter with somebody who is, is really poor, or very vulnerable. Those, those kinds of things can make us uh, perhaps um, a little ill at, at ease. And yet I think if he can encourage us to move there, there's all kinds of possibilities that breaks open. You know, we're all having this deeply intellectual discussion, but I think for many Catholics who don't talk about our religion intellectually, 
um, some of what the Pope says is confusing, especially about homosexuality, right? Who am I to judge? Um, don't criminalize it, that's wrong. But in the Catholic Church, it's still sort of an abomination. That doesn't make sense. Is that to me? Sure, why not? <laughs> Gabrielle, you want to take that? Hold it right now. <laughs> I, you know, I did an article back in like 2014, 2015 saying, I don't know that people are confused so much as they're being told to be confused. I mean, again, there was a really organized opposition to this Pope that emerged really quickly. I remember before he, we talked about him coming to America in 2015. I was living at Washington. I went to a panel at the Cato Institute, which is the big libertarian think tank in Washington, DC. And I'm on there with this person from the business school at Catholic University, which is this real libertarian right-wing outlet. And, uh, and he started saying, well, you know, Francis, we have to remember that he's, uh, you know, he's this, he's from Argentina, Argent, Ar Ar Argentina. He thinks of capitalism as crony capitalism. He doesn't, he doesn't understand our good capitalism here in America. And I'm like, well, wait, 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 wait a minute. Nobody ever said Pope Benedict you know, he's from this Bavarian village. You got to remember, it's looked like a snow globe. You're either the Pope or you're not. I mean, it was so condescending and they never did this with Benedict or John Paul. And I, and this is one point that I don't think we've made tonight that I think is really important. One, and, and we're at, at a university, NCR is the, the voice of the Catholic left. And I put this on the Catholic left. John Paul II was not an American neoconservative. And for 25 years, we allowed George Weigel and Richard John Newhouse and, and Michael Novak to tell us who John Paul II was, and we didn't push back enough and say, no, you don't get to claim him as your own. John Paul was great on unions. John Paul was great on, on, on fighting. You know, he, he signed off on the, the pastorals of the 1980s. Yes. He, yeah. they, there was an effort to suppress Salem, the Latin American Bishops Conference in 1992, and he, he defended and kept Salem going. So... But we, but we think of John Paul and we think, oh, he was so right wing. Benedict, he was so, Benedict has some beautiful writings. Go back and there was always good stuff there. And instead, so many on the left were tantrum. Well, he doesn't talk about the things I want to talk about, or he doesn't talk about them the way I want to talk about. And shame on us. We needed to engage intelligently and, and push back against the right wing narrative, which is always going to be there. It's always going to have 10 times as much money and all the loudness and reach that that money provides them. And so part of what's going on, and the book I recommend, Catholic Discordance by uh, Massimo Borghese, an Italian scholar, it's been translated into English, really goes back and unpacks the very specific ways American neoconservatives tried to interpret John Paul II in ways that were dishonest. And it's a really important, because as you you know, this didn't just fall out of the sky. These things have been going on for a long time. And I think we on the left, through a fit in, 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 in with Benedict, and we needed to push back and 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 say, wait, 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 wait. We can disagree with the Pope. People can disagree, be confused, but we we let the the right wing define the church for a long time, and we should have pushed back. How? How? You write and you research and you and you say and you look. Well, what what did he say here? I mean, this they were so much better at this. So, so after Centesimus Honest, which was the encyclical in 1991, came out, 100th anniversary of Reverend Navarum, they had study guides published that same day that picked out the two or three paragraphs that they thought were pro capitalism and ignored the defense of unions, ignored all the other the the criticism of of free market capitalism that they left on the on the side. Did we did I miss anybody on the left doing that kind of stuff? We just we're not as good at getting our story out. I think, we're, and what you said about the, the, what this Pope's skill is he gives us the visual. He gives us the symbol. He gives us the gesture that has, that's what it means. Yeah, and I think I, that's- I, I just want to push back a little because again, I'm, I'm we're having a deeply intellectual conversation and I'm going to kind of dumb it down, right? So when I listen to the Pope, um, he kind of opens the door a little tiny bit but not the whole way and nothing really seems to change. And we're still stuck in that so-called conservative church. Am I wrong? 
Well, I think it's changing because of the process, but it isn't. You, do you see immediate results? No, there, there was a, a, a wonderful um, article I read about uh, Arch um, Cardinal Kupich in Chicago, and he talked about the fact that uh, Francis has a long view of what he's about. And there's a process that he's trying to guide us on. And he's not going to allow it to get preempted where we have to close it off and have a decision today. He's going to trust that over time. He's 86. <laughs> I know, I know. I pray for a good, long, and healthy life. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> You're right, he is 86. But the other good news about him is that he has, uh, if you look at the number of, of um, men in the Cardinal, uh, the College of Cardinals that have been appointed by Pope Francis, he's really transformed that. And I, and I'm, I have some confidence. I think he's also thinking about his legacy long after he's gone. And he and where that really where that gets marked out in a very significant way are his appointments to the College of Cardinals and to the bishops across across the, this country and across the world. So I have faith in that. Um, let's talk about politics, shall we? <laughs> because the presidential election of 2024 could be very interesting in a Catholic kind of way. Um, Catholics are split, as Joe indicated. Um, but let's say. Ron DeSantis wins the primary and runs on the Republican ticket. He was raised Catholic. Let's say pigs fly. <laughs> I mean, it just. Well, OK, but it Catholic, can happen. 50 percent of Catholics in 2016 and 2020 went for President Trump. So and I don't want to disrespect them either. I, I really don't. It's just that's a fact. So I guess my question is, is as we approach the presidential election of 2024, um, I think that tenets of our Catholic faith will be used to appeal to voters. And how will that further divide the church? I don't have an intellectual answer. But what I do have is a memory. Um, I voted in my first election in 2020, first presidential election. I was a senior in high school in 2016, so I wasn't 18 yet. And I'm from a, let me rewind a little bit. I'm thinking about the idea that we lead with issues first and then you know, the religious justification falls into place. So many of my peers and I were 17 when Trump was elected. I grew up in a blue collar town in the Bay Area, predominantly Latino, Filipino, and I remember, and I'm sure all of you who are at LMU in this at this time can also remember that day. I think everyone remembers that day. But it hit home because it was home, you know? And I went into my first period class, which was AP go US government. And we did not do anything that day because my classmates were coming to class with tears in their eyes with real fear about their own status, about their parents' statuses, their grandparents' statuses. And I think as we move towards the 2024 election, my generation remembers that and remembers that powerlessness and the effect that it had on our families. And again, I'm speaking from a bubble, but we lead with issues first and we carry those memories. So those are the memories that inform those decisions, issues first, but then. So, so for those more conservative Catholic students, right? For students who are religious, who did support President Trump, um, how does that factor into conversations between more progressive Catholics like yourself and more young conservative Catholics? Does politics always enter the picture? That's a good question. I think at LMU, those groups do encounter each other. They share a worship space. Um, I wouldn't necessarily be the right person to answer that. There are campus ministers in the audience who could though. <laughs> um, 
I think inevitably it does come up because we have student organizations that support those beliefs, but those students share facilities, they share spaces, they share liturgy. And so I would hesitate to say that it comes up in conversation, even though I'm sure it does between friends, but it comes up in the things you see on social media, in the things your friends repost, in the events that your friends attend. So it does come up, but not necessarily in the direct way you might imagine. Well, that gives me some hope. Um, but there are a good number of Catholics who did who do vote conservative, who do vote Republican, and shouldn't re respect shouldn't we as progressives respect them as well, and how they feel and why they feel that way? I I do. I mean, I I. Um also remember what an awful feeling it was the day that uh, the night that uh, Trump went over the top. Um, I remember calling the editor at NCR and saying, bad for the country. Not so bad for NCR. <laughs> you know, so much easier to criticize the president than to have to you know, say, I don't want to cheerlead too much. But um, no, I think that, you know, it's, it's funny to get to the bigger issue of polarization in the country. I always used to say Americans will come together when we have a common threat that does not know any ideological or partisan division, something like a pandemic. And then we get a pandemic and who the hell is in the White House? The most divisive person who figures out how to make it polemical. I mean, it just, who attacks Tony Fauci? I mean, it just, I mean, it just, this was insanity. So I think the, the, Again, how do we get out of that? Um, I want to pick up on something you said, which is I think in an ideological age, experiences like symbols are the things that start bringing us back together. Okay. And I'll give you an example. Uh, I think four or five years ago now in San Diego, they had a diocesan synod. And one of the things that emerged that they did not see coming San Diego has two very distinct Catholic populations a Latino, largely poor, somewhat immigrant, second, third generation, but that population, and a lot of much more conservative, largely white military uh, population for the Catholics. And the conversations about the needs, not about their ideas, not about their politics, but about what they needed, what the parish could do better to help people. What emerged was in the white military parishes, was the experience of loneliness that came from their men and women being deployed. And what happened in the Latino parish conversations was that experience of loneliness from having a family member who had been deported. And the need of the church to attend to those experiences of absence and loneliness were the same. Those are the kind of moments this synodal process, I think, can bring to the core you may not end up agreeing with that person who voted for Trump, but you can, you've just experienced some of their humanity. That's beautiful. That's when the faith is, is going to be most active and alive and, and vibrant. Um, a few days ago, I reached out to Nancy and I said, Nancy, what kinds of questions should I ask? And I really like the question you posed um, as far as solutions, that we should step back and we should ask ourselves, what is the church? What is it? And I love that, but please explain more. Yes, well, uh, thank you. Um, I, I mean, I think it's really the question, the question, what is the church? When we say the church, are we associating it exclusively with the bishops and, and ordained clergy, or do we have a larger vision of it? Do we understand it institutionally, or do we understand it essentially as a sacrament? And I realize that's a, maybe a very intellectual way to go but, but with the conversation. But by that, I mean, is the church here to help make God's love for all of us present and alive and vibrant in this world? Is that the driving vision and connection that makes us church? And that is a very Catholic sensibility, a sacramental sense of what it means to be church. And I think that's very important. And Pope Francis, I think, is tipping us in that direction when he talks about the fact that he wants priests and pastors and all of us to, he wants his bishops and his priests to smell like the sheep, right? And what's that about? I mean, 
is that, that he wants them to take their pastoral role very, very seriously. And, and he wants to privilege that and make that as important, if not more important than the doctrinal questions. And that's, that's a challenge. I think that's, that's part of, of, of the struggle that we're having today. But I, I think that's a point when he talks about the church as a field hospital and that the Eucharist is not for the perfect, but for those of us who are wounded and who need healing. And um, when you're moving, so that's the move in a pastoral direction. I think that's brilliant and that that's really calling us to the kind of vision of church that can help to bring us together. That sounds so lovely. <laughs> it does. It really does. Um, and when I really thought deeply about that question that you posed, you know, you think like, who should decide what the church is? Who's the authority? Who? I mean, should we be an authoritarian church? Who should decide? We have authority in the church. Um, and, and, you know, Lumen Gentium is, is the last document that from Vatican II on, on, on the church. And, and it, it sets out several models, but the one that was probably the newest for us and, and was, was the people of God, uh, which suggests several things. It does not suggest that we're a democracy, right? It is, it's a statement of ownership. We are a people of God. We, 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 are, we belong to, to the God who has called us. I mean, the initiative is always God. One of the smartest things, I, I helped organize a conference last year, and it was under Chatham House Rules, so I can't say who, say that, uh, who said this, but it was a bishop, and it was a meeting of theologians and bishops. It was, it was a fascinating conversation. But one of the things he said was, um, you know, we live in a culture of grievance, and we have a theology of grace and gratitude. And those two just miss each other all the time. And this is a really key insight. And I think, again, part of what Pope Francis is calling us to Part of what I think we can do in our own world, and that will help answer this question, what does it mean to be a church? What does it mean to be a people who belong to God, to be God's people, is to show forth the grace and gratitude in our lives. Not the, you know, Salem witch trial, Cotton Mather, you bad Christians. You know, we all can, you go on the internet, you'll find the Christians who are there with the stones just waiting to throw them at her. You know, the oldest son, how dare you reward that prodigal? I mean, that's there. I call them the uh, Javert Catholics. Those, those who falter and fall must pay the price. And, 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 and Francis is showing us a very different face. But again, I just want to, because it has to be said again and again, how much, how myopic the U.S. church is. And, and I think you spend some time with some Latin American, lay people, Latin American bishops. Are, it's a, just, it's a different animal. You, you go, I was just in France last month. It's a different animal. Um, and, and, and they love this pope. And uh, and the idea that we're going to you know elect a pope whose whose primary mission is going to be the traditional Latin mass that just ain't in, in in the cards. I don't think we never know. Remember, he was elected by a group that was picked by Benedict and John Paul II. So you never know what what the conclave is going to do. But I am available, and I look good in white. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, our thanks again from NCR to uh, President Snyder, to Carol, to Ava, and everyone who's been involved in putting this uh, evening together. I really appreciate it. Let me uh, end briefly on a very, very Catholic note. I'm going to ask you for money. Uh, NCR is an independent news organization, not just uh, journalistically and editorially, but financially. We don't get any money from any church organization, any religious order, uh, any bishop, any diocese. We depend largely on uh, donors and members and readers. Uh, I think if we've learned anything over the last hour or so, we've learned that it is the job of Catholics today, as we look forward over the next couple of years, to be well-informed. Uh, and that's what we try to do. We try to tell people what's really going on. NCR was formed in 1964, but a bunch of guys who thought that the church deserved to be covered the way reporters covered Washington, DC. Right? With real journalism, with skepticism, with holding people to account. 
and speaking for the voiceless. And we need your help doing that. And we need most of all for us to pay attention. So there are these wonderful blue cards that have uh, that give you various ways you can donate that Laurie from our staff will hand out. Please take one, please share one with friends if you can. Um, and anything you can do would be appreciated. But most of all, please read us. We have no paywall online, please go. If you wanna subscribe, please do, but read us. Otherwise our work is worthless. Um, read us and pay attention. I think a lot of Catholics, more casual maybe than the folks in the room here tonight, don't pay attention. They say, well, these guys don't speak to me, so why should I listen to them? And then they wonder why they get the Supreme Court they get. And they wonder why certain laws get passed that seem wildly unpopular. So I think it's our job as Catholics to pay attention to what's going on, especially over the next couple of years. So at the very least, please read us and pay attention. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for you. Appreciate it.